Then there was the moving camera model. Imagine using closed circuit television so that you don't have to shoot the movie up front and have it be static, but you can have the camera be controlled by the controls of the flight simulator. I've got a slide on that in just a minute. But the camera actually shows you a scene based on where you fly the camera using closed circuit television. And then there's night scenes. When we finally got our fancy computer image generators, the first thing that we generated was night scenes. You'd have people practice landing an aircraft at an airport at night. And all you would have to generate was then the lights on the runway and maybe some lights on the horizon and things. We weren't ready to do the runway itself and the tower and the buildings and the terminals and all, and all the other planes, but we were ready to do the lights. And then after we'd done that, we finally evolved enough computer power to create the 3D graphics you're used to seeing now. The 3D graphics that you run on your PC now. It's amazing. Here's one of the uses of those map boards. Those map boards we cut out that people used to stand around a table and practice doing a mission with. Somebody had the genius idea to take those boards and bolt them onto the ceiling. And you bolt them onto the ceiling and that gives you a flat floor to drive your simulator around on. So you create a little go-kart kind of device that's the cockpit of an airplane. And you put a periscope in there, but instead of looking down at the terrain, you look straight up at the terrain. He can't tell the difference. And then as he dips and goes higher, you have the periscope zoom in and pull out from the terrain to imitate his change in altitude. Same thing when he banks. You turn the, the lenses so that his scene angles sideways. And you don't have to move the, the platform at all, but you end up driving around in a big gymnasium floor. Really a clever device. That's 1949. You can't tell me that we're smarter now than they were then. That was clever. 1950s. Bell Helicopter created a helicopter trainer in which they essentially amputated the cockpit of a helicopter and then they put a dome screen underneath of it, very similar to an IMAX dome in the movie theaters. And then above him they put a giant view graph projector. And the giant view graph projector has a six foot by six foot piece of glass in front of it. And painted, hand painted, on that piece of glass is the scene that the helicopter pilot is supposed to fly over just like the simulator next to it, as he flies around, the piece of glass slides under the lens of the projector. And when he zooms in and pulls up, the lens zooms in and pulls up on the piece of glass, making the objects get bigger on the screen or smaller on the screen. And that worked pretty well until you got the edge of the six foot piece of glass and didn't work very good at all, but it worked. Here's the closed circuit television system I described to you. In this example, you have a long strip map, and that map has a robot arm that can move back and forth over it at any point. And on that robot arm, there's a camera. And the camera just looks at the map board. And as it flies around, it transmits the picture as it would be seen from the aircraft at that position back to your flight simulator. And so you're still watching a movie. It's exactly like a movie. It's being projected like a movie. It's just being driven by closed circuit television instead of celluloid film. Same idea. Very clever again. Also very expensive. A device like this takes a lot of physical space. And if you want to move it, oh my gosh, just forget it. Not quite as convenient. Now, does it cost more than a digital simulation? probably cost less, but it's very inconvenient anyway. Now we're up to image generators like this. If you sit in any flight simulator, any tank simulator, any computer game, you expect to see graphics like this. And this is very state-of-the-art graphics that you're seeing here. You get very high resolution detail on trees, buildings. You get a wide perspective out of the F-16 simulator, and you can get much narrower perspective out of the uh, helicopter simulators. But this is the kind of graphics that everybody has to have right now. This is the kind of graphics that a lot of companies are purely in the business of providing to you. Evans and Sutherland, Lockheed Martin, Intergraph, uh, SGI, uh, even Sun Computers is in that business now. Everybody's trying to provide you better graphics. And if you're willing to spend a lot on the hardware, you can get great graphics. They want you to be able to spend a few thousand on the hardware and still get great graphics, which you'll get pretty soon. The motion platforms. You saw the picture of the motion platform in 1958. 
Here's a picture of a motion platform in 1990. That platform looks real similar to the one they built in 1958. The idea is still pretty much the same. It's hydraulically driven. There are more pistons now, so you have more degrees of freedom. And by combining the movement of the pistons and the changes in the computer graphics, you can make the guy feel like he's making bigger turns than you're actually having to replicate with the motion platform. You don't actually have to pitch this device over on its head to get this guy to feel like he maybe did follow, spin over on his head. Here's an F-18 flight simulator. We've taken away some of the immersion that you would find in a motion platform or that you would find in an igloo. And all we're presenting him with is a curved screen and he has to fly this plane and land it on an aircraft carrier. This simulator is specifically built to teach people to land on aircraft carriers. It's not for air-to-air -air combat. It's not for group tactics. It's to land on that aircraft carrier. Before you send the guy out there and say, you think you can do it? And being as full of testosterone as he is, he says, absolutely. And then splashes the thing in the ocean and you went, well, there was $50 million. Oops. Well, you get him to practice on this simulator again and again and again until he can actually do it. Now, one of the other things they've added here is that computer screen to his right. That computer screen is a control screen. And after he's landed this aircraft, he can reach over there and hit a button and tell the control screen, reload me and let me run again. So it's very cost effective. You don't have to have a bunch of computer operators standing around waiting, going, hurry up, land the plane, land the plane so I can reset you. He can pretty much operate them, this thing himself. They get it up and running, uh, go off, and he'll, when they come back, he may have landed the plane a hundred times all by himself. Here's the dome simulator. You take the cockpit of an aircraft, get some cutting torches, and cut it off. Not really. But it, you do have the vendor build almost the same cockpit for you. And it's instrumented, and you look out, and what do you see? The inside of an igloo dome. Inside that igloo dome, there's a very nice projector over your head back there. And that projector can fill up 300 degrees of this screen. And so you can do air-to-air -air combat inside this igloo. You can do virtual pitches all the way over and, and chase down people that you see off to one side or to the other. You can do much more maneuvering in a system like this. But there's no need to spend the money to build a full immersion flight simulator like this if all you need is landing on an aircraft carrier. There's all different kinds of applications and, and different levels of immersion. Speaking of levels of immersion, here's a weapon station simulator. This weapon station is meant to stimulate the backseater in an F-117. His virtual world, when he goes on a mission, has nothing to do with where the church is out the window or where the tower is in Baghdad. His virtual world is on the dials and the gauges and the computers in front of him and on the maps that he brings into that cockpit with him. So to train him, you might not need any 3D graphics at all and you've immersed him in a complete virtual world. It depends on what your operational reality is. It may not involve 3D scenes around you. 1983. Silicon Graphics invents a fantastic program that they call Flight. Gary Taroli was watching the Navy Blue Angels and said, I bet I can build a simulator like that. And so he sat down with his SGIs back in 1983 and created a very basic flight simulator. You could take off, you could fly around, you could land. That's it. All by yourself. SGI, being in the hardware business, not the software business, included this on every computer they sold. And everybody who bought the computer, the techies were going, this is fantastic. I can waste half of the day flying this thing. And the managers were going, can you delete that thing from the system? We got to get work done here. Well, in 1984, they only made it worse. They added a serial cable so that two planes could fly in the same virtual world together. So you could fly wingman and you could sweep around each other and you could try and impress the other guy in the virtual world with you. Try to keep up with me. Come on, I bet I can land before you can, et cetera, et cetera. Now two guys can waste half a day playing on this thing by themselves and go, this is really great. And two managers can say, can you delete that thing? <laughs> I've got work to do. But 
they d demonstrated it at, at SIGGRAPH in 1984, and it was only generating seven frames a second. Now, a movie, what we consider real-time graphics, is 30 frames a second. So this was generating about one-fourth of what you would consider real-time. But still, people were going, I don't care, this is fantastic. They weren't done yet. 1985, if you've got two planes flying in a virtual world, what's the first thing you want to do? You want to shoot each other down. So in 1984, they added the ability to shoot down the other guy's plane. So now you don't just swoop around and go, man, I would blast you if I had you right now. You really do blast them. Shoot the other guy out of the sky. And now you've got not two guys, but they added networking capability. So you've got 10 people all having a big dogfight on your computer network in your laboratory. And that doesn't take a half a day. That takes all day long. All day, all they do is play in this flight simulator. And now you've got the manager of 10 different people going, you're killing me. I'm not buying SGI anymore. Well, that's not what really happened. Really, people got a vision from this. They looked at this and went, I get it. We can do that here. And so it was no longer such a black art that only two or three organizations knew how to do. Everybody who bought a Silicon Graphics had the seeds for building their own interactive simulators. And they said, we know what to do from here. Now, one of the things that they learned was that dead reckoning is absolutely important. The reason that you joined a network and you can only add 10 of these flight simulators on the network at a time was because they were generating the particular information for each aircraft every time they needed to render a frame. So if you're doing it seven times a second, all of the detail about one aircraft's position and orientation was being published seven times a second. And if you get the, the frame rate up to 15 times a second, now it's 15 times a second. Pretty soon, your network is full and you can't add any people. That's when they started saying, wait a minute, we don't necessarily need to tell you where I'm going to be for every frame. I'll tell you my position and orientation and my speed. And you just project that into the future. You just dead reckon that until I tell you different. And if I change heading or speed, I'll tell you, and then you'll know to slow me down. That was kind of opening the door to, we can tie more than 10 of these together. We can make this network a lot bigger than this.